active listening versus passive listening and how to tell the difference. An interview with 20th century avant-garde musicologist Hannah McLaughlin, and our composer profile is on the Russian masters. This is Early Music Monday. Active listening versus passive listening is a discussion that many of you may have had in your undergraduate studies, but perhaps you haven't. Actively listening, you know, intently focused, cognitively being aware of what you're listening to, and that's the only activity you're doing, versus passive listening of, you know, listening to music in the background while you think about something else or do another cognitive activity. Now, there's two ways that we can think about active versus passive listening. Active and passive listening as a non-participant and listening as a participant in an ensemble. We're going to talk about ways we can influence both of those subgroups in terms of active versus passive listening. So actively listening, I mean, most of us do that most of the time. If you're a choral enthusiast, a choral educator, a professional singer, musical, if you have any sort of career in music or are an amateur musician, you definitely know how to actively listen. And we also have our music that we put on in the background and we passively listen to. The trick is, is, do we consciously switch back and forth when we do those activities? Do we subconsciously slip into passively listening when we're supposed to be actively listening? And do we sometimes, when we're having music on to calm us down or to do homework in the background, do we start actively listening? That's me. I can't, I don't know how many of you in this audience can do anything productive and just listen to music in the background. It's impossible for me. I can't handle it. It's like the little ADD squirrel on whatever movie that is. Squirrel on Up, the dog. Squirrel, squirrel. It's like every two seconds I'm like listening to something else because I'm so just like fascinated with the music that's happening. So I really struggle with even knowing how to passively listen anymore. But many of the audience members and singers who will become audience members or when they go to concerts themselves, they listen to the music the same way that they would listen to music on their drive to work or school while they're doing the dishes, et cetera, et cetera. So for them, they don't even realize that they're listening to this concert music the same way they listen to their background music. They listen for the lyrics or what it makes them feel. And they kind of passively listen, like just kind of revel in those feelings or whatever. But how do you listen for melody and harmony and texture and drama and text painting and word expression and dynamics and all those types of things? If you're a music educator or a professional musician, you've been trained in several years of schooling how to do that. The audience doesn't have that luxury. So why on earth would they come to our concerts? Well, we got to find ways not just to perform pop tunes all the time, but if we slowly introduce them and show them how to actively listen and be transparent about that, they'll start to pick up on things. And as they learn new things about it, they have a greater appreciation for it. So think about your students in class, as non-participants, meaning this is not ensemble work, ways to get them to learn how to actively listen. In the interview later with Hannah, you'll hear some of these ideas be bounced around, but I had a professor at BYU talked about music maps, this giant poster board blank, and listen to Mozart's Symphony Number no. 1 or whatever. And you have to draw the music with abstract symbols. 
So this one three bar phrase or whatever, or this one three, four measure that was strong, weak, weak, like a boom, chuck, chuck kind of thing. He drew a triangle. And as the piece plays, he would trace his drawing with the end of his finger or is the tip of his pen. And you could see how he interpreted the music visually through this music map. It's a really cool idea. My students really liked that one when we did a unit on music maps. You can have them listen to a piece of music that's in a foreign language and just have them write emotions, one word emotion words, just bullet points. You get one word per bullet point. You could have them draw a scene from a movie or something or or create one in their head. What are they imagining if this piece of music was a scene from a movie? And then and then have them discuss, well, what made you feel that? Like, did you hear what instrument adds right here? Go back and play it for them again. Oh, look, it went from really high, pretty, to really low and kind of ominous sounding. Why did it, you know, what happened with that switch? Did the text reflect that? Here's, here's the words. Or if you're not doing a piece with text, you can help them just understand, well, why did he decide to shift there? Little things like that. And those activities don't have to take very long. You play one piece of music and discuss it. It could take 10 minutes. You do it one, one time every couple of weeks. You can really help them start to listen for things, which prepares them to be really good audience members and singers as participants, which we're going to talk about in just a second. But now with the audience, you still don't even get that luxury of having that time to like, quote unquote, teach them like they're not in your classroom. You've prepared this music, you've rehearsed this music, their students are, are getting it, they're in it, they're learning how to actively listen to each other, they're just like perfecting it, and it's awesome. And then you get one chance to give it to the audience. And what if they don't get it? like epic flop, right? So there's ways you know, to help the audience understand it as well because they want to get it. There's sometimes this mentality of it's like us versus them. Like we're on the stage and we're producing this really high art for you to enjoy, so enjoy it. And a lot of the times the audience doesn't really quite get it and they feel that disconnect. So instead of thinking about how can we just give this product to the audience? You know, how do we bring the audience with us to the music? What are some small, simple things that we can do to help translate some of the four to ten years of education in music that we have? Because they don't want to feel like, oh, like they think they're better than us or whatever. That's not going to bring an audience to your performance. And of course, it's not anyone's intent to be like, yeah, I want to show how much smarter I am than the audience. But sometimes that message comes across when we try too hard to be clever or genius or artistic in some way and then show that to the audience. Here, let me show you what I've created, what we've created. But there's ways to help the audience come to the music. Put the super titles up. That's one. They do it in opera all the time. Why not do it at a choral concert? What if you created a slideshow with pictures or just like stock video playing some kind of mood theme in the background as you perform a piece? You can do a pre-concert lecture. Paul Hindemith, a 20th century composer, moved to the United States and he, he would have the audiences sing you know, if he was doing a Renaissance piece or whatever and they had a Cantus Firmus, he, he would have the audience sing that ca Cantus Firmus first so they could recognize it. I've also had sopranos just say, here, sopranos, sing measure six and seven. Audience, listen for this theme right here. And you turn to the audiences and then you say, okay, sopranos, here you go. And you have them sing that two-measure phrase, just the sopranos or whatever, or the main theme or the tenors or any other section. And then all of a sudden it's like that's going to come back a lot and it's going to come back in longer rhythms, shorter rhythms. And it doesn't have to take too long, but 
those are ways to help the audience actively listen for something instead of passively listening the same way they listen to the car radio on their way to work. An example from Sound of Ages, we back in May of 2020, we put out a video, a music video to the piece They Will Rise by British composer Jonathan Dove. And we wanted to honor the military, but this was shortly after the COVID outbreak happened. And so we also wanted to honor first responders and medical workers, anybody that's really trying to keep us free and safe. So we sent out an email, and Utah's a pretty patriotic state, and and there's a lot of medical field here. University of Utah Hospital is a big deal. So there was a lot of people in the community that we know had deep passions for family history and for serving in the military and first responders and the medical field. So we just sent out email blasts and social media blasts asking people to submit photos of their ancestors or their living relatives or friends who are serving in any of those capacities. And we, in the middle of the music video, we put together a slideshow honoring these people. And that video by far has the most views of any of our videos on social media because the audience made a connection because they were listening to the words, but more actively and intently than they perhaps would have in any other setting because they were connecting that to something personal. And we're all that way. There's no difference between the audience and the conductor or the singers. We just happen to have the luxury of way more time with the music to make those emotional connections and the training to be able to actively listen to certain things that perhaps we wouldn't have been able to emotionally connect with before we learned how to listen. So we have to help the audience gain those active listening skills sometimes so they can have this emotional experience with the music as well. So that's the first category of active and passive listening of the non-participant. Now, if we think of active versus passive listening as a participant, it's a completely different realm because now all of a sudden we're talking about performance practice. I guarantee that most of my students at the public school are actively listening while they sing like 5% of the time. And that's mostly my fault because I haven't taught them that that way, you know. But finding ways to get them to actively listen to each other in performance creates ensemble singing. So one way I found is to just, we have three different standing arrangements. I'm sure many of you do the same thing. Three different, that's, and if those of you who are audience members were like, why the choir is moving around all the time? That might be one very practical reason is because standing next to someone with a different part, standing next to a different group of people that you never stood by, like, you have to listen more now. You're like, oh, I'm not used to hearing this. How am I fitting in? So that's one way. That's really simple and practical. Another way is I put them towards the beginning of the year in quartets or quintets or sextets. I try to keep it to one on a part if I can, depending on my numbers, but that really... And then I, I will have them rehearse. Okay, we know this passage well enough now. You can sing it on your own. Spread yourselves out. Go outside. Spread out in the practice rooms and down the hall away from other classes and sing, like rehearse page five and six together just in your quartets and see how well you do. It gets them to sing independently, but again, it gets them to, they have to listen to themselves and each other now because they can't just rely on someone else and just mindlessly match them singing the same part as them. Another thing, uh, in an interview coming up, I think in our next episode with the conductor of the Bird Ensemble, Mark David Obensa, he talks about teaching his singers at the, at the college he teaches at to sing in perfect unison. Can you hear your pitch locking in with the person next to you? 
and helping them hear and feel when it like locks and you hear those overtones ring. It can take just a couple minutes. You can do this in seven minutes or five and then spread it out throughout the week of just a couple minutes each day and really make a lot of headway. And then I've had students come up before to the front of the room and I've had them sing a pitch and then I try to sing a perfect fifth below it or above it. And then I'll go and I say, okay, raise your hand when it goes and it locks in tune. And I just slightly go in and out of tune, mostly by just like not singing good technique and then like locking in my soft palate lifted and stuff. And they can all, they can all do it. So then I say, okay, now let's do it together. Ladies sing this pitch, men sing this pitch, or whatever, like tenor sing this pitch, basses sing this pitch. So you can figure it however you want. You can do it in two, three, four parts. And then just say, raise your hand when you feel like it's locked. What are you going to do to get it locked? Okay, can you listen to yourself? Can you listen to your section? Stand in a circle. Listen to each other as a section. Match your vowel. Each section, stand in a circle. That's another option. There are a lot of ways to kind of get out of the day-to-day -day monotony that will help them listen louder than they sing and learning how to actively listen while they're singing something from memory, whether that's in a rehearsal or it's something they've performed 50 times. Are they still actively listening to keep that in tune and to keep their technique just locked in and to keep their tempo and rhythm moving perfectly together as one body. I would love to hear more ideas that you've tried and have had success with. If you have any of those ideas, feel free to shoot them my way. We'll feature them in, an, in another episode. We talk about ensemble singing or we'll, we'll do a reprise of, of active listening. Because um, I, I know the, the whole is smarter than the one. So those are the two ways that I tend to think about listening. First of all, active versus passive, and then as a non-participant, and then as a participant. Um, I think it's super important to be able to instruct those things and to be aware of those things, both in shaping our programs for the audience and the singers in general, and for creating a good ensemble sound. And not just in early music or historical music, but music from all time periods. We go next to our interview with Hannah McLaughlin. Hannah received her bachelor's degree in music education with a choral emphasis from Brigham Young University. And then after her student teaching, she pursued a master's degree in musicology from Brigham Young University as well. And she studied Pauline Arleveros and 20th century avant-garde music and... It's crazy. Uh, I don't know how one gets to that point. But props to her. And she's a genius for it, actually. She also has this unbelievably encyclopedic knowledge of pop music and pop culture music. It's insane. So when I have a question about anything music history... She's the first person I think to ask because she's a genius and she has that musicology perspective and a music education perspective and a choral perspective. So that's why I wanted to have her on the podcast to get that those three perspectives kind of tied into one because it's really – I learn a lot every time I talk to her and I want to – give her a chance to share that knowledge that she has with all of our listeners. Thank you so much, Anna, for coming on. Um, I'm going to learn a lot from your perspective. I love hearing perspective from different um, kind of areas of emphasis in the music world as a conductor. So why don't you just talk us through maybe your experience with music and how you started whenever that was and all the way through till now. Sure. Um yeah, I'm going to keep it brief. I, I, I practiced this. Okay, so I began as a performer, like most high school, junior high kids do. I feel like performance is usually the first, well, listening, of course, is the first way we, we learn about music. But 
Um, education wise, of course, I learned uh, how to sing and play the clarinet in high school. I was in a lot of theater, music theater, and so I learned to perform a lot through that venue. Um, and it was during high school when I kind of decided I'm going to get a degree in music education and composition. Nice. Um, for some reason, I thought I could handle two degrees at once, which of course that didn't happen. I, I got into the music education program at BYU um, in choral teaching. I worked with Paul Broomhead, loved it, uh, thought it was fabulous. But, um, you know, in, in, at BYU and in most, I think, music education programs, they make you take these uh, music history classes as part of like your general music education degree yeah. requirements. And um, for most people, those are a bore. But for me, it was like, oh, where have you been all my life? I <laughs> didn't really know what musicology was when I, when I first came to college. Uh, and that sort of, and, and, and then in addition to that, I took a class with um, Rob Dunn. Uh, he taught uh, Music 278. It was a general music education class, you know, meant, designed for educators to learn how to teach music outside of just the, the performance angle, outside sure. of a choir or a band or an orchestra. So we're talking younger kids most of the time, you know, we're teaching them about, you know, rhythm and, and melody of, and sight singing, of course, but also a lot about um, just listening and, and, and sure. learning about music from that more cerebral or, or, or analytical point of view. Right. So those two things kind of sealed the deal for me. It was like, yep, I want to be a musicologist. Uh, I love performing. I love singing. I love teaching singing. Um, but I would much rather talk about this music. I'd much yeah. rather sit around with a group of people and talk. So I got my master's in music education, or not music, excuse me, musicology. Um, I still composed uh, all through that period, especially because another thing I learned about in college was um, avant-garde 20th century experimental music, which I also fell in right. love with. So I did a lot of composing in that realm. I did a lot of improvising. I, again, I still love to sing. I was in several choral ensembles during my uh, my master's degree in Utah, but I knew, you know, I'm going to write books. I'm going to, I'm going to teach these boring music history classes <laughs> that, uh, that college kids are going to groan over because they'd rather be in their practice rooms. That will be me. Um, and so that's sort of, you know, I kind of decided it's my life's mission to kind of make people be in love with talking about music as much as they are in love with playing it. So that's where I'm at now. I, I don't perform very much now simply because, well, of course, COVID ruins a lot of performance opportunities, but right. I've had to sort of prioritize, okay, I need to write a dissertation. I need, I need to be focusing on this one aspect of music that um, it, it needs, I, I need to specialize. So sure. I've, I've put performing on hold, but I still love it. And I still love it when other people do it. So hopefully yeah. someday I'll, I'll get back to singing again. But. Well, and I, I appreciate it because even just you talking about your story, you, you, this is not a video podcast yet, but for those of you who are listening, her face changes when she started talking about how much she loves talking about music. Like she doesn't even have to be talking about it. She can talk about talking about it. And it's that, and, and you can tell that that passion is there. So I actually think that the students won't groan over your books. Cause I, I think you have <laughs> such a way of, of talking about it. That's so relatable that it makes it ex as accessible as talking about their favorite music artist on the radio. Music history is a place where you're not just talking about, you know, the shape of your vowels, or but you're talking about things like, you know, bias and uh, ethical sure. research and, and, you know, how do we take someone's, you know, art and, and deal with it in a way that is moral, that is uplifting, that is, that is ethical, that sure. brings joy to the world. So, yeah. Yeah, and how do you interpret, yeah, how do you interpret something that was written 400 years ago and make it relatable in a society that's completely changed now. Absolutely. You know, and how do you, how do you kind of navigate that to where students can understand it and grasp on, especially teenagers when, you know, I'm out of date and I feel like I was up to date six months ago and now I'm already, you know, so. Oh yeah. I think that that's. A, the, the kids know more than we do about this stuff. <laughs> in, right. In which. So, so maybe for me, that's it's more my... about just providing the content and then they perform the methodology more than anything. Yeah. Well, I think that's great. Well, maybe let's start there. I wasn't planning on that, but what do you think <laughs> then? How, how do you think you would do that as an instructor? 
Like what are, if a kid came to you and then there's a piece, like what, I don't know, what kind of things would you do to make it relatable to those students? Whether, I, whatever time period. I thought a lot about this because I think there was a question that sort of stirred my mind to this. And um, one thing I do feel, and again, this is a lot, a lot of this is changing in the modern day, you know, traditions of, of yore when it comes to music education have, have definitely uh, transformed. But um, I still feel like maybe we as teachers struggle with letting, or, uh, giving the students permission to tell their own stories about this music first, hmm. which it's it's difficult to do that because A, often you're in a performance venue where you do have to kind of all be in a united frame of mind about this piece of music so that it, it, it co it's coherent and, and sure. you, know, you have a message you want to send to your audience. And, and of course, every source you read, everything has its own biases. But honestly, I feel like giving the students a chance to listen to music with kind of I'd say virgin ears, but, but like, you know, this sort right. of, this brand new fresh, so that they can come up with their own narrative, right? Um, give them a chance to kind of explore that music in their own, on their own terms, in their own words. What does this remind them of? You know, if you were to make a movie about this piece of music or, you know, if it yeah. music would be put in a soundtrack, what movie would it be? Um, you know, how does the music make you feel, et cetera, et cetera. So giving them that chance to sort of uh, soak in the music like a sponge on its own terms first hmm. is I think the the first goal we should have because then once they have that personal investment right hmm. yeah then you can start comparing that investment you know in, with others and you and you yeah. can put it in your scope and say well this is how you felt about the music but what did Palestrina feel or what did sure, Mozart sure. feel what did Bach feel what did John Cage feel etc um and and because those students have that platform of of personal investment of personal uh, love for the piece of music, it it becomes just that much more easy to start springing off of that platform into all of these other directions. Um, you know, yeah. you want to look at this through a, a historical performance lens. Well, bang! Let's see. Did I was I already doing that in the first place? No. Well, why not? You know, this that's where that's where the passion comes from. And I do feel like again teachers these days and are, are very aware of that and, and I think do a pretty good job at allowing students to to experience music on their own terms but it's still hard especially sure. with a little time and, and with especially again I have my own angle that I want right. to share you know I study music from a utopian lens I'm interested in the politics surrounding ensemble work and sure. and I want to talk about it but you know giving students a chance which of course in a collegiate level, that often means I give listening assignments that have no other readings attached to them, right? I, yeah. I just, just listen to this piece, you know, if it's a symphony, listen to it three times. If it's a shorter piece, listen to it, you know, five, seven, however many, and and write a response. Just, yeah. just on your own, no one else's opinions, but yours. And then that's where we start. So. Um, anyway. Well, and I think that that's totally doable in a public school setting, junior high, level all the time i would i would have my students listen to a piece of music and create like a music map draw abstract symbols that you feel like represents the music draw a scene from a play or a movie yeah. of what's going on as you listen that's and and rob dunn encouraged that yeah that's where i learned uh, it that's music maps i remember we did these big white you know sheets of tablecloth or something and and we drew in black permanent marker just these very abstract squiggles and lines um i, I watched fantasia as a kid i'm, I'm sure you yeah. did too that's a movie yeah. that i hope we don't lose because it, i think that it introduces that idea yeah of personal in like you know these animators weren't you know when they they wrote the nutcracker they had not a nutcracker in sight this was entirely right. a new picture that they were painting yeah of, of a very historically informed piece of music, uh, but but I feel like that that really is where we should start. Again, I, I think maybe especially for people who are interested in music history and who are interested in all of this context and who want to introduce you know their students to a lot of different uh, you know approaches, we can be in too big of a hurry to be like, well, this is what Mozart thought of his requiem, sure. or you know, this is. And here are the missing pieces we don't know about this piece of music, et cetera, which is, again, great. And some students will immediately pick up on that and respond to it. 
But again, you can't really do that if you're not invested in the piece in the first place. Yeah, just- I think that's totally the and and as a public school teacher who's trying to to keep a program running, <laughs> we talk about it all the time. I, I did an interview with Andrew Crane about giving them success and helping them sing with tone. And there's a, there's a bunch of things that you can do to make it a complete experience for them to where they'll want to be there. And I think this is one of those things that you can add because if it's just about like, Oh, we sang this cool frozen song or whatever, it, even if that initially draws in a couple students, it will always fade. So yeah. finding, finding things like this and, and for voice technique, really learning how to sing is, is a big passion. We talk about tone like most of the time because I struggled with it so much in high school and in college, I failed voice lessons. Like my, my recital hearing was a fail, so I had to stay an extra semester. So for me, that's one of my kind of crusades is, is tone. But now how do I use all these other things to, to keep the students to give them a full experience? And I think when you say, let them create the framework first, it, I don't do that. I do it the other way. I'm like, okay, you guys, Mozart is the goat, like of all time. So who is the goat to you? You say Beyonce, I say Mozart. You say Taylor Swift, I say Mozart. Like, so. Well, and that is great. I will say that, that, you know, kids look up to that kind of passion no matter where it comes from. Uh, and and I, I do believe that students who respect you, which I believe you've, you earn respect from students, you personally, Kat Cameron, oh. I'm sure you have no trouble earning respect. I hope you. so. Thank you. You know, they, they will take that and they, they will go, well, why? Right. Why? Surely there has to be a reason. Why? Is yeah. That? And of course, then, poof, the, again, sure. that curiosity. Yeah. Um, but you, you need to plant that curiosity first before you start planting any actual factual. Yeah, ones. and I think I get, just like what you said, I get so excited to explain, well, he was dying and then, you know, <laughs> like all this stuff. And then, but to, I got to, that's a really good reminder for me, I guess, is to, <laughs> Thank to you. let them connect first and then help them then have something to connect it with later instead of giving them the connector and they don't have a personal connecting spot for it yet. Mm-hmm. So that's awesome. Well. It, so, it's awesome when it works. I will say a lot of sure. a lot of students really don't want that. That's of course a problem with any, you know. My my, my husband teaches math. If the kids don't want to learn math, they're not going to learn it. Right. Uh, which again, that's kind of why I, th- I think it's not. I I do understand there are a lot of different philosophies about this as well. But it's not a bad thing to start with pop music. It's not a bad thing to sure. start with with music that you know. Take take the shortcut. Take that shortcut. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it is really. It, well, and it's interesting you brought that up because that, that reminded me of last semester. Well, the end of last year, I taught a rock and roll history class. Sweet. And, you know, and that's where I started. I started in a rock band in high school. And then, so that was my beginnings. Wow. I don't know very much about it now because I've completely transformed into choral nerddom. But I talked about how, like, we talked about recording studio back in the 60s and how record labels came about and how producers came about and agents and the business side. And I was like, how many of you have been reading the news about Taylor Swift yeah. and her, all of her recordings? So, like, there, there's even historical context for that. You talk about publishing with William Byrd and Thomas Tallis and talk about how Taylor Swift is fighting the same battle today. Like, it's the same fight. but That's brilliant. We have different technology. So... You know, and it, some students might latch onto that, some students might, but then give them a reading assignment about Taylor Swift. I don't know. That just well, came yeah, to my head, I, right? Absolutely, yes. I mean, I will say my favorite, my favorite classroom days are ones where I get to, you know, show them an episode of Scrubs because <laughs> Philip Glass's Koyanis Katsi shows up in a scene, <laughs> which is like, incredible. <laughs> yes, you know, like that's, you know, that those are some of my favorite days. Um, Luke Howard. I don't know how well you you got to know him when you were at BYU, mm-hmm. but he's he kind of specialized in that, in finding kind of pop cultural uh, resonances um, between, you know, modern, you know, modern pop culture versus classical pop culture. And, and sure. of course, of course, Handel's Messiah was his big thing, you know, the, yeah. how we view that, that piece now versus before. And, um, but, you know, he showed us a whole bunch of really cool, like, look, by the way, they're using a chant here or, or whatever, yeah. like, you know, just kind of random uh, television shows, movies, you know, uh, right. quotations from other pieces. That's a big thing. And, um, you know, you see yeah. 
you know, Rachmaninoff shows up everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, so, so yeah, that's, rock. that's absolutely, that's a tool. That's a huge tool. And, and again, there's just so little time. I feel like that's right. the kind of the biggest problem is, you know, you, you want to spend a lot of time on this, but also you have a concert to, to, to program and, sure. and you have, and these kids still don't know all the Latin yet. And, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's just, it, it becomes, which is part of the reason why I chose to move out of high school and into college, because then I could specialize sure. more. Um, but I think, but maybe that's what I'll do is, uh, is uh, maybe eventually, or for, for people listening, we will have resources on Sound of Ages website. Maybe, Hannah, if you, if you think of it, I can reach out and if you can have some resources of maybe some quick, like a quick book that has a cool chapter on something that's like a quicker thing for teachers to reference. Because I think that for me, I don't know how to do it sure. short, short. So what's a cool like little video clip I can play or, or you know, and, and you know, if you have just a couple off the top of your head or something. Well, resources. yeah, I, I, you asked a question like this, but I think I kind of took it in a different direction. Oh, um, I feel great about it. Which I, I mean, <laughs> Uh, the, one of the biggest sources I have um, is the Coral Journal, which I'm sure you and, and your audience know already. Um, I, I will say, as a musicologist, as someone who deals with very deep literature about different topics, sometimes, weirdly enough, the Coral Journal, which you know tends to be marketed toward you know educators and and choral people more than musicologists, it, the only stuff in English about certain mm. pieces or certain certain composers that's you know i i need yeah. to study, i needed to study kostelsky and tenea these two russian guys for for my general exam and there was literally no other english article about wow those composers except in the choral journal you know uh, vladimir uh, morrison wrote a, a 2008 article about them it was pretty short again like they're they're geared toward more general audience or or at least sure. audiences who don't have a musicological background um, but a great place, like if, if you're if you're planning on writing a program note, or if you want to spend yeah. a day talking with your kids about uh, about the historical context, that would be one of the first places I would go. Um, it's you know JSTOR has it, EBSCO has it. If your school yeah. doesn't have access to those that journal database, uh, odds are you know someone who does. <laughs> and, yeah, absolutely. And it's not hard to to track those down. I, you don't need to buy your own subscription. Um, so that would be one place for sure. But again, that's, that has less to do with, you know, uh, uh, educational uh, strategies and more to do with just where to find the content. I would also say, you know, of course, you've got things like, uh, you know, anthologies like the Norton Choral Music Anthology for the big ones, the, you know, the, the, you know, your, yeah. your Alice, your Victoria, your, uh, your Ray Fawn Williams, th things of that nature, of course. And I will say I like those a lot because, you know, you have the score next to the notes and I'm a score. Yeah. I want to write a book about score study. I feel like there isn't one and there yeah. should be uh, um, because that I think, I, again, that's something maybe you could even introduce your kids to as well as, you know, take the score home and, you know, put hearts over your favorite part of the piece as you listen. Oh, that's awesome. Or, or, you know, if, if there's a moment when you hear the tenors suddenly stick out, put, put a highlight over that part and, and yeah. just anything you hear write it down in your, you know, again, I come from a, a religious background where we studied our scriptures. And of course we would mark up our scriptures like crazy. Sure. And, you know, colors. Yeah, that's so no great. Colors. It is exactly the same thing. You know, it's just, yeah. another way to, you know, physically engage and visually and kinesthetically engaged. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's an easy homework assignment. It could be a fun, fun homework assignment. Right. And it wouldn't take very long, you know, listen to it no. twice. Okay. Take it. Yeah. And... I, I remember at one point I was listening to a piece and said, Oh, this sounds like Star Trek. And I put down in my notes, this sounds like Star Trek. And I, I came back to that score, you know, five, six years later. And I'm like, what, what was it about that part that sounded like Star Trek? I, I had no idea, but it right. was a fun thing too, to see how your listening changes over time. So yeah. yes, highly. And again, I want to write a, a a book. I, I want to write like a, a handbook or a, a study guide or a like a, a an, an interactive curriculum that that does stuff with with score analysis. Oh, I I will be the first one <laughs> to sign up for it. So, and when you get maybe let's do another interview in a couple months, and I'll have you maybe come up with some ideas or something. And we would love to have because I think that's the kind of thing again that I think what COVID did for a lot of choral conductors in the professional realm and the educational realm is 
is getting us to think outside the box. And the ideas that you're talking about aren't COVID related at all, but, but we, we, t- we tend to, in the arts, myself included, kind of have our way of doing things and it's, it's the best way. We don't admit that out loud, but deep down we feel we found the best way. But thinking outside the box too, yeah, those are great little, even during well, class. And, and you, can, you, know? you can totally teach them, you know, the, the triangle versus the line versus, I mean, like, you know, yeah. you can give them tools. Again, my, my young women's teacher t- gave me all of these little symbols you could put in your scriptures about, well, here's a baptism symbol or here's a right. you know, love. You put it anyway, like just a lot of different little things. But yeah, giving them that room to, to explore on their own and to try finding their own way is abs- you're absolutely right. Like that is. And uh, I think that's what makes so the, the less accessible pieces more accessible. Some of these things you're talking about make it to where those then become their favorite pieces and, and they, they want to sing it year after year and i'm like we can't sing it next year like we can't sing it this year we sang it last year and yeah. those and i'm sure a lot of the audience have had those experiences where the the hardest or least fun boring classical piece becomes the favorite yep that happened with my girls too when i taught i, I have a student teaching at pleasant grove junior high school and i had these wonderful girls who were in the intermediate choir so they weren't even there was a top girls choir and then there was this huge i think there were 80 girls uh, holy intermediate. cow yeah, the PG Junior has a huge choral oh. program, um, and I wanted to teach them. I don't remember what exactly the, it was. It was a, it was a reduced, a, a simplified palestrina. It, it wasn't awesome. the whole, um, but it sure. was for girls' choir, and it was their first time singing a cappella. It was their first time singing in Latin, um, and I, I really do think that you know putting. First of all, putting the girls up to the challenge and then having them meet that challenge, of course, gives them a lot of excitement, and they they love yeah. the piece for that. But you know, I told them, you know, this was a time, pianos didn't exist. You know, they, yeah. the organs didn't really exist. Uh, yeah. the, you know, they, all they had were their voices. So yeah. you know, what, imagine, imagine being in that world where, because again, these girls were very, they, they were very nervous about singing acapella. They thought they <laughs> sure. couldn't do it. Um, yeah. so that was sort of my way with, with them to, to get them into it. And none of them could read music either. So I kind of had to teach by rote, which was very difficult. Sure. Uh, I, I, I probably going, looking back, I probably wouldn't have had them to pick that piece yet. It was kind of a, a, sure. a ambitious project, but, but they ended up loving it. And I do think a lot of that had to do with placing it into some level of, of historical context. Let's shift gears here a little bit. Um, I would love to hear some of the things that you've been studying about these Russian composers and, sure. and maybe specifically about some of their choral works and how it relates to, to Russian early music and Russian music history. And then maybe, maybe some pieces, a piece or two that you think would be doable by like a high school group. Or if, okay. if you know any, if you don't know any, that's totally fine. Like, well, I, I would say the bigger question is what is worth performing? <laughs> um, oh, that's fair. I, well, and, and the reason why I say that is simply n- not to say that there isn't beauty in, in, these, in these, a lot of these Russian pieces, but um, this, is, this is indeed maybe where the rift between performer and musicologist is the strongest. Sure. Is that, uh, you know, for a musicologist, beauty might not be the most important aspect to look for uh, when studying a piece of music. Um, so for, for some context, I should probably back up here. So the Russians have always loved chant. They're, of course, you know, from a, an Orthodox tradition and they had their own, you know, Kievan and, and uh, Zaminsky chants. I, I think I said that right. Um, <laughs> these very, me. very, very old chants from, you know, dating back hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, but then what happened was, you know, Russia was also this very politically fraught climate, not just in the recent century, but for a long time. They've had sure. many revolutions uh, and many, you know, uh, movements, uh, uh, you know, changes in power. And a new czar uh, equals a whole new regime, you know, completely new. Right. Minds. So a lot of these pieces, a lot of these chants um, were hidden, destroyed by by the beginning of the 19th century so this is you know 18 not not 18 any 1700s type hmm. period gotcha right um and a lot of them were warped you know kind of made into something they weren't or they weren't originally because at that point russia was beginning to you know put their ear over to oh what's going on in europe oh you know we need to update our sound 
So they've been borrowing a lot from Europe all through the 19th century. They, they want to sound like Europe. And of course, you get composers like Tchaikovsky who are going out of their way to, to sound very European. And I will say a sure. lot of Tchaikovsky pieces are absolutely beautiful. Um, right, you know, right. Choral works. I, and then, you know, a couple of them, I, I remember we sang in Luke Singers a couple of years ago, we did the uh, Roses. I can't remember what yeah, the- Yeah, the Crown of Roses. Yes, yes. That one, it's beautiful. And I think maybe, you know, a high school choir could handle that. Totally. So yeah, there's plenty of beautiful music by Russian composers that mimic European styles and do it well. But if you're looking for something Russian, there was very little to find of it by 1850, right? Hmm. And a lot of these guys at the time, these music scholars who were becoming well-educated, wealthy, you know, and, and were, this was also a time when there was a lot of, you know, social liberation in Russia. We had the emancipation of the serfs. So they were starting to think very nationalistically, right? And they're like, this isn't Russian music anymore. So let's find these old chants. So, so they had to, you know, they did, a, that's where, you know, musicology as a, as a discipline arguably began in Eastern Europe and Russia when they were looking back at these old chants that they then had to kind of, you know, rewrite because they were so broken and partial and, and, and. Wow. Uh, so they had to, so much of the music I, I had to study for my, for my general exam was these very rudimentary experimental Russian choral pieces that were trying to mimic what they thought the What's chant happening? writers were trying to write. Exactly. Hmm. So, so the, and, and they're not all, you know, uh, successful experiments. You know, a lot of them are you know, Kostalski's work. You know, a lot of it's, I mean, if you get a good choir to sing them, of course, it's going to sound pretty no matter what, because it's a good choir, but like, there's really nothing to, to write home about. Right. A lot of them are kind of boring, uh, you know, weird polyphony type pieces where he's trying sure. to recreate Russian polyphony. So it's, so yeah, again, like, but these are pieces that are very exciting for a musicologist because these are like, great yeah beginnings of a of what became a much more beautiful or, or, or complete. right uh of course i don't know if you i mean have you sung any salvation is created with your with your students before no i have not uh, uh, but there's you know yeah like every russian composer ever has you know set that yes text and, i and will say sort of i actually performed that song in band uh, in high school not in choir oh, wow. I would say it's a little low for a, and a little high for a, a high school choir, but gorgeous piece of music. Um, sure. So yeah, Chesnikov would go on to become like a, a big name that was writing right. I think, kind of worthy of 21st century choir type music. And then of course, finally, oh, and then Teneyev would be another one. He, he's written, uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember any that are really good for high schools and, and I'll, I'll definitely send them to you if you want to post them on the website. Cause yeah, that would be great. People, like his 12 choruses is, you know, he, he's writing these melodies that sound like chant, but aren't chant, right? Yeah. But at that point, the composers weren't just trying to recreate old things. They were now trying to make their own beautiful new thing, right? So, sure. And and maybe, so, you know, who kn you would know better than me, maybe, but just like kind of taking maybe the very, very bare bones skeleton of that old and then putting this new sound on top of it, you know, creating, okay, well, they have they wrote very melismatic chant, so we're gonna do that. But then nothing else is the same except for that one thing. Yes, that's just an example. And, and, you, know, of, and you know who did that? Rachmaninoff. I mean, yeah. the, the 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 pinnacle of Russian choral music. For if you ask any Russian scholar, they will say, "Well, I guess his Saint John of Christendom comes in a close second, but yes. his his Vespers, his All Night Vigil uh, absolutely." Collection, and that is, it's such a cool piece because it sounds beautiful. I had no way, when I first learned, you know, Bogorodice Dievo and a couple of other, of the, of the, I did not understand what I was singing at all. And I still loved it, which again, my, right. I wrote my own story behind it. And, and I love my story and I, and, I, and I take pride in my own little story of that piece. Yeah. But it turns out these beautiful melodies he's written, um, half of them aren't his own, you know, they're actually taken from, from chant, but the other, a couple of them, including, you know, my favorite, everyone's favorite, Bogorodice Dievo, is in fact his own chant, chant, quote unquote, that he wrote based off of those old melodies. Awesome. And that I think does kind of, that signifies that, that, be, that comes to represent this, this, you know, this apotheosis of the Russian spirit where we are learning from the past and we take pride in the past and we are nationalistic 
you know, and, and we love our, our religious heritage, but at the same time, we also love art and beauty. And, and actually, again, this is, I'm getting into my nerd world here where, you know, he's writing these pieces during what, uh, what many call the silver age of Russia. I think, you know, 1917, this is right at the, the crux of where the revolution sure. happens. Right? So there's a lot of questions happening right now about, about exactly that thing is, do we, do we worship the past or do we move into modernism? Do we embrace, you know, the new? Um, are we interested in, in realism and in, in saying what's true and saying what, what will be morally the best for society? Or are we interested in this more decadent art for art's sake, um, you know, the, this pursuit of like higher mystic truths that maybe, you know, science or positivistic thinking can't tell us, you know, and so there's this, these clashes in between those two, you know, schools of thought that I think are really represented well in, in the all night vigil, especially. Um, and so it's really and that's exciting. today. Like that's exactly today too, right? Like in in, in so, really yes. the whole world, right? Like, are we going to just like what you said? Are we going to, are we going to try to hold on to the good of the past? Are we going to destroy all of it? Are we going to hold on to all of it? Are we? What are we going to do moving yeah. forward? Like you know, do do I as an artist have any sort of moral obligation to make my music mean something or 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 give a message or or absolutely. Tell a Story, or can I just make art because it sounds good to me? You know, that yeah. that's those are not questions that I'm ready to answer, that no one was ready to answer, no one is. Sure. Yeah. But uh, Marina Frolova Walker has a great chapter. If if anyone is interested in the backstory about these Absolutely. Russian nationalists, this this new Russian choral school that came out in the late half of the 19th century where they're exploring these these chants, Marina Frolova Walker has written a great chapter on it in, in an anthology that I can point people to if, if you want, but again, it's, uh, I would love, I would love it to post that. I, I think it's great. It's, and just have again, a list of resources. It's about music that isn't necessarily performable, which again, that's kind of a hard thing, but sure. I will say granted that that is what I love. Is, I mean, I, I, I'm studying non-performable music. I'm studying music that's meant for one pianist with eight hands. I'm studying music <laughs> that's meant to kill people when it's performed. Right. I'm, studying music that was written for instruments that could not ever exist, you know, instruments that right. use that, uh, you know, the, the clouds play the bells. That was one, you right. know, metaphor that Scriabin used, right? Right. You know, how do clouds play de bells? They don't, but you right. still wanted it anyway. So, I mean, that's sort of my realm. Sure. Yeah, but, that, but it gives us a special a, realm. That and, and as me, I'm such a pra like a pragmatic person and such a practical person. Okay. Look, <laughs> you're just singing badly. Like <laughs> a lot of choral people get into like, sing it, sing it sweetly. And I'm just like, no, just sing it better. Like just, <laughs> just take a better breath. Take, but, but that perspective that you give of, and, and that musicology adds again, it's you, you take a little bit from the other kind of areas of emphasis, emphasis and the other experts and you kind of start to widen your area of influence and widen your perspective so you can you can say hey this is a way different piece and so we can keep learning i think it's great so yeah all of it to open our perspective to 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 try something different and yes. to think out of the box and to to come at it from a different angle and there's ways that we can put that into our curriculum um well and, I think a lot of it too is musicologists also need to come to you. And I know, you know, I don't know what musicologists are listening to this or who needs to hear this from that world. But um, I do think we as scholars uh, of historians, theorists could also do a better job at opening up the, the pathways between performance and, and analysis or, or <laughs> history as well. So two way well, street. And I feel like this is a good way to maybe open the open the gate to that. So so thank you. Um, You're I'll, absolutely uh, welcome. If you ever we'll, just want to talk about this without a microphone on, please. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Anybody. No, no, yeah, seriously. And uh, we'll uh, you, you can find. Uh, we'll post if you want to post an email address or something on yeah, the website as well. That's all we would, I have at the moment. I, I that's great. I'm not cool enough to have a website yet. <laughs> hey, that's okay. Me neither. So <laughs> we we have a choir one, but uh, um, uh, again, this has uh, been really fun and opened my eyes to a lot. And, well, thank um, you. We'll have you on again sometime for sure. Oh, sure, absolutely. Again, anytime. 
uh, and and thank you so much. I, I'm of course I'm flattered that I was selected, especially among you. You interviewed Andrew Crane, who is just this amazing <laughs> you know, BYU professor and all, all this stuff, and I'm still just getting my doctorate. But uh, I, I, I really appreciate you you uh, extending this invitation. This was this was fabulous. All right, for our composer profile today, we're going to change things up just a little bit. We've been talking about Renaissance composers, but we're going to fast forward a couple hundred years to the late Romantic, early 20th century. And we're going to break from Western European tradition and take a trip east to Russia, visit those crazy Russians. Now, I love Russian choral music. It's so rich, it's so thick, so these nice, thick, juicy chords, and oh, it's so good. And as Hannah mentioned earlier, the political landscape mixed with the music and how it works together is just like the most fascinating thing to study. And there's far too much to go into on a podcast episode, but, and that's not really the point of the composer profile, but I encourage you to go and and do some reading because there's some great stuff um, to be learned. Now, when we're talking about easy pieces, this whole, and we're going to talk about more than one composer because it's, it's difficult to find easy, intermediate, and difficult pieces by one composer within, even though it covers a wide span of time. Um. But the really interesting thing is, is you can go back and find pieces by Bortniansky. Bortniansky is a Russian composer who lived and composed exclusively in the classical era. But while Mozart was, I mean, think about Mozart. So you have Mozart in Austria doing his thing, and then you have Bortniansky over in Russia composing music that really is the foundation of what would become this kind of Russian romantic style that carried all the way through to Rachmaninoff in the 20th century. And it didn't change a ton. Like, it, it was modified and kind of perfected as it went along, but really, that style of homophonic texture, really wide tessituras, really thick textures as well, and thick harmonies really carried through from Bortniansky all the way through Rachmaninoff. Stravinsky's kind of, and, you know, Scriabin and all these other composers have kind of their own thing too. But in the choral genre, you can really trace the canon, whatever that means, all the way through all three of those time periods. It's really fascinating. And the rest of the world, it's like they're just doing their own thing. Seems like Russia has always done their own thing. It still does their own thing. It's awesome. And what's interesting is that if you think about Tchaikovsky, that's where we start with our easy piece, quote, unquote, easy piece. But we'll start with Tchaikovsky. And the interesting thing is he was perhaps the most Western European influenced Russian composer of such a high profile. And, you know, composers like Rimsky-Korsakov and the big five and all of them, and moving forward, they kind of rejected that idea. And whether that's, again, there's so many, so many details about how, many, how much of that was influenced by, by the state and how many of that, how much, oh gosh, I can't speak. How much of that was influenced by the state and how much of that was themselves being loyal and to the state or being nationalistic or having this great pride in their own style, regardless of the nationalism underneath it. It, it. There's all kinds of nuggets of wisdom and knowledge connected to these things. But there's no denying that there is a very distinct Russian sound that even though Tchaikovsky was more influenced from Western European 
composers, he still has some of that Russian color to his compositions. So an easy piece, again, I say easy, and it's super relative, but an easier piece, I should say, is the piece Legend by Tchaikovsky. You can translate it to English, and it's a sacred text called Crown of Roses. Or you can do it in the Russian secular language. But this piece is homophonic, very hymn-like, but it has great Russian romantic harmonies. The ranges are way less extreme than some of his contemporaries. And again, it sounds a little bit more Western European, but it, it definitely has that Russian color. Another, and it's pretty short. Another piece that would be good is Evening. And this is for, sorry, I should have said, Legend is for SATB chorus, mixed chorus. Evening is for a men's chorus, TTB, splits into three parts. And this piece would be awesome for a high school men's chorus. It's like that like Russian man, just like real men singing, you know. But you can show some really great recordings to your high school men's chorus and kind of get them to duplicate a little bit of that dark color and... It would be really great. It's homophonic, similar feel to legend. It's romantic harmonies, Russian feeling, and it's secular. It would be so great for a high school men's chorus. Now, another easy piece would be one of the col- uh, one of the pieces from a collection of ten children's songs that I found by Viktor Kalinikov. They're for two part and piano. Now, there's a caveat. The scores that I found are all in Russian with Russian characters. So I have no idea what they're saying or how to pronounce any of it. And I couldn't find translations anywhere or pronunciations. So I'm working on that. I'm going to keep working on that. Hopefully I can track some down and I'll post the results when I eventually find them um, on the website. But if you know... If you have a colleague or know someone who speaks Russian or can read Russian characters, can give you a pronunciation guide at least, you can find a translation. It would they're really accessible by like a children's chorus or a junior high chorus. Again, two parts, piano, and you can teach them some Russian and they're short. So it would be really fun. The third piece in the easy category is Bogorodizia Devo by Rachmaninoff. Now, I can literally feel all of you freaking out right now and throwing things at me, saying, that's not an easy piece, are you kidding me? I know, I know, I know. You can all calm down, I, I know. It's freaking hard. But there are some modifications that you can make. Not modifications, but there's some things that you can do for with a choir that's junior high, children's chorus or something, that maybe can't access the full Davisi and full ranges of the piece and still perform this. You can have all the if let's let's take a junior high seventh grade beginning choir for an example. So you have sopranos and you have some boys who are in the cambiata range. Their voices are just starting to change. But they're kind of altos, kind of cambiata, tenor-ish. Basically wandering aimlessly around the lower alto range. And you have these kind of altos. So you can have those boys sing that tenor. That tenor part goes really high. But that's like right in their wheelhouse at this point. And you can have the altos sing the alto line and the sopranos sing that soprano line and totally not be out of their depth in terms of like it's going to be super taxing and hurt them in their voice technique. And I did this with my seventh graders four years ago, Spanish Fort Junior High, and we did Foray's Requiem, the first movement. And... 
I did that exact thing. The soprano sang soprano, alto sang alto, and my boys sang alto sometimes when the tenor got kind of low for just, I think it was only like four measures. I can't remember though. And then that tenor solo is kind of like almost in the sweet spot of their range where they speak. So, and they loved it. And I showed them, I was like, look, professional choirs sing this. And they felt so cool. Oh, it was so fun. And they still talk about it. And uh, it, was pr- it was pretty exciting. So there's a couple of other pieces from Rachmaninoff's All Night Vigil that you could do that with. Like, Lord, now let us thy servant, the Nunc Dimitis. That tenor solo is high enough to where it could be sung by one of those cambiata voices. Or you could have the piano play some of the other things, and have all the boys sing the solo. Like, there's so many alternatives to just performing it exactly as it is on the page without completely, without changing one bit what the composer intended. I know many of you might have a different philosophy, but I think that, especially in an educational institution where, you know, my, my junior high, we performed in a cafetorium, that's what they called it. The cafeteria was connected to the auditorium. We didn't have real risers. I, they were falling apart. There was maybe room for 200 parents. Like It's just a small little space. And we're not, I mean, we're not changing the intent of the composer, but we're not here to make this definitive recording of Rachmaninoff. My goal as a junior high teacher was just to get them excited about real music, classical music. So if you're in a situation like that where, you know, if you're a professional choir or a community choir and you're 100% performance driven, then yeah, maybe that's not the best for you. But if you're in, in, in an educational institution, this might be a great way to introduce pieces like this and great classics to them, to the students, and get them excited about it to where they feel like they're performing, like, the real stuff because they just want to grow up so fast. So, there, soapbox over. Uh, Now on to the intermediate piece. One piece that I found in my searching was Elegy, again by Viktor Kalinikov. Elegy, it's in Russian, it's short, it's secular, homophonic and the ranges are much more limited once again than the kind of sacred genre of these Russian composers. It would be a really great piece for a high school concert choir, a community choir, and they could be really successful. And again, it's Kalinikov is that uh, he is in that like Russian sound and would really add a great kind of change of color from Western European or American music that you might have on your program. Now for a difficult piece, all you have to do literally is search Divine Liturgy or All Night Vigil. And if you get anything from Gretchaninov, Rachmaninov, Kalinikov, Govanov, Kedrov, Chesnikov, Arensky, like you could go on. They all wrote one, and they all split into eight parts. They're all in like insanely thick, luscious Russian romantic harmonies. They all have insane ranges, basses going down to you know B two, no B (laughs) one, C two, you know like this insane stuff which, of course, 99% of the time they're just in octaves, so you can have them do it an octave higher. And the sopranos are just, like, hanging up by Gs and As forever. It's a, it's a sing, for sure. So make sure that if you program one of these, that you really are wise in your rehearsal process is to not wear the singers out. I did... Viktor Kalinikov's Sviatetihi, 
with my high school concert choir, which is my intermediate choir. And they were pretty successful. The ranges aren't the most extreme in as far as that group of composers go. And they've all set, I mean, almost all of those composers I mentioned have set that text. But it's not quite as extreme in the tessitura range area that a lot of those other composers are. So, And they, they were really successful. I mean, they kind of drug their heels about the Russian, like, oh, the Russian, like the Russian's so hard, Russian's so hard, but they, they did, they just didn't, they were just whining because they had to memorize it, and they were a bunch of whiners. But they stepped up to the plate, they stepped up to the challenge, and they ended up being really successful, and some of them ended up really liking the piece. It was great. So it can be done by high school groups and, and up. So, that's our composer profile, the Russian Masters. Um, if you want just kind of a surface-level representation of the Russian Masters, you can look for Tenebrae Choir's CD of Russian Treasures, is what it's called. And it has a lot of these pieces and a lot of these composers, and it's, it's a really good... It was kind of my first introduction into that world of the Russian sound and kind of opened my eyes and led me down kind of the rabbit hole of research into other pieces by these composers. And um, so I recommend that CD if you're unfamiliar with Russian choral music as a good place to start. Thanks for joining us for Early Music Monday. I had a great discussion about active listening versus passive listening. The interview with Hannah was really eye-opening for me. I hope it was for you too. And talked a little bit about the Russian masters. And I hope you all go listen to some Russian choral music. And we'll see you next week on Early Music Monday. <laughs>